It's March 1968. An unexplained and catastrophic accident causes a Soviet Gulf II submarine known as the K-129 to sink to the bottom of the Pacific Ocean while en route to its patrol station off the coast of Hawaii. Publicly, no one in the world knew what happened, where the submarine was, or what secrets might be hidden on board. Behind the scenes, however, reporters caught wind of a classified U.S. government operation to pry the wreckage from the floor with a giant claw and uncover whatever secret technology might be hidden within. The mission was codenamed Project Azorian, and it was launched from a covert ship named the Glomar Explorer. Pressed for comment on the operation, a U.S. government spokesman flatly replied, quote, We can neither confirm nor deny the existence of the information requested, but hypothetically, if such data were to exist, the subject matter would be classified and could not be disclosed. From the limited information that has since become available, it is believed that K-129 was carrying three ballistic missiles. Each was armed with a one megaton nuclear warhead, which were aimed and ready to launch at West Coast targets in the United States in the event of nuclear war. The submarine's presence was likely detected by the United States Navy's underwater sonar system it used at the time to identify and track underwater Soviet threats. Little is known about the cause of the accident, or how the submarine came to rest three miles, or five kilometers, below the ocean's surface. The lost vessel was of particular interest to U.S. intelligence agencies, as it likely held important clues about the Soviet Union's nuclear weaponry, encrypted communication systems, and advanced submarine technologies. Envisioning a treasure trove of top-secret information and the opportunity to steal a Soviet nuke, President Richard Nixon approved the creation of a special task force within the CIA known as the Special Projects Staff in August 1969. The U.S. Navy was left in the dark in order to keep the project black. Tasked with retrieving the submarine and its valuable cargo, the group was instructed to carry out the mission without alerting the Soviets to the fact that the U.S. even knew the K-129 wreck existed. Project Azorian was so secret that only a small group of people in the White House and CIA knew about it, including the President and his National Security Advisor, Henry Kissinger. Over the next year, CIA engineers developed a plan and completely new technologies to retrieve the 1,750-ton submarine from the ocean floor. The plan relied on a specially designed sling that would cradle the submarine as it was slowly pulled to the surface by high-powered winches on a heavily modified ship. The plan was so controversial that the program's leadership initially believed there was only a 10% chance of success, but proceeded despite this and rising costs. The invaluable intelligence opportunity the submarine offered was too good to pass up. To launch the operation, the CIA contracted the master shipbuilding company Global Marine, nicknamed Glomar, to build the specialized ship for the mission. And in order to conceal the ship's true purpose, the CIA contacted famed explorer, eccentric, and reclusive billionaire Howard Hughes, who would provide a cover story by pretending to be using the ship for a deep-sea mining operation. Named the Hughes Glomar Explorer, the ship was completed in 1973 and stationed in Long Beach, California, where two dozen cargo vans worth of classified equipment were loaded onto the concealed vessel as it prepared for its covert mission. To outside observers, it was made to appear as if the ship was embarking on a quest to extract valuable manganese nodules from the ocean floor. Soviet naval forces had previously swarmed international waters just north of Hawaii after K-129 failed to establish radio contact, and, at least officially, it was an analysis of that deployment that first alerted U.S. naval intelligence to the presence of the lost submarine. The information was supposedly triangulated with an acoustic signal characterized as, quote, an isolated single sound of an explosion or implosion, a good-sized bang, to locate the wreckage. Later rumors, however, suggest that the USS Barb, a permit-class attack submarine, had actually tailed K-129 from its home port of Petropavlovsk and witnessed firsthand the sinking of the Soviet vessel. The final resting site was confirmed by the nuclear submarine USS Halibut using a towed sensor package. Even though it would be several years later that the Glomar Explorer would reach K-129, the Soviets still maintained a watchful eye on the area and spent two weeks following the salvage vessel with suspicion when it finally arrived on site in the summer of 1974. Spies may have tipped off the Soviets to the existence of the operation, 
but Soviet intelligence was unable to confirm the salvage target and determined that a deep ocean recovery was impossible from a technical standpoint. By the time the Soviets eventually realized what was happening, it was too late for them to stop the salvage of K-129. Steel pipe sections, similar to those used on oil drilling rigs, were used to carefully lower a massive mechanical claw named Clementine to the target object. It took three weeks for the salvage team to secure K-129 with the claw, and eight more days to slowly winch the submarine to the surface. On August 8, 1974, the Glomar Explorer appeared to have completed its mission, and set sail to Hawaii to deliver its secret cargo. The entire operation was recorded by a CIA documentary crew, but to this day, little is known about what specifically was recovered, or how valuable the intelligence gathered was. Although the film and all details remain classified, it is widely believed the project did not recover any of the nuclear ballistic missiles. An investigative report published in 1998, however, alleges that only a 38-foot-long section of the K-129 was recovered, including its nuclear-armed torpedoes. Sources suggest that Clementine suffered a catastrophic failure during the ascent and sent two-thirds of the submarine crashing back to the ocean floor. The only portion of the CIA documentary since released shows a memorial service for K-129 that was given to the Russian government in 1992. Only one year after the K-129 was partially retrieved, top intelligence officials became aware that the Los Angeles Times and the New York Times were both working on stories to expose Project Azorian to the public. The White House and CIA feverishly worked to prevent the publication, believing that exposing the Glomar Explorer's mission would put pressure on Moscow to mount an aggressive response, escalating Cold War tensions. There was also little appetite for revealing the $800 million cost, $4 billion cost today, of the program to the public. However, they were unsuccessful, and the stories were published in early 1975. Shortly after the revelation, Rolling Stone columnist Harriet Ann Philippi filed a Freedom of Information Act FOIA, request with the CIA, seeking documents related to the covert mission and any CIA efforts to persuade the media not to report on it. In the view of the CIA, either option of acknowledging or denying that Project Azorian existed would have given hints to the Soviets about what the U.S. did or didn't know about K-129. It was thus determined that it was better to keep the Soviets in the dark and guessing about what the U.S. actually knew and what was recovered. To thread the legal needle, an unidentified associate general counsel at the CIA formulated what would become known as the Glomar response, which, quote, neither confirms nor denies the existence of specific information in the name of national security. Much like the true story of the fictitious ship behind Glomar, it seems that we will remain in the dark.